All right. So podcast time, and this is going to be a good one, is on lure retrieves. One of the most important things as far as getting strikes from lures and one of the things that's least talked about. So we're going to dedicate this entire podcast to lure retrieves. Justin, kick it off. All righty. So this was kind of an amalgamation, the $5 word right up front, of a conversation that Wyatt and I had a few weeks back. We had our holiday party and I can't remember how we got onto this topic, but we were talking about lure retrieval and how we work different lures, whether it's a paddle tail or a jerk bait. And we kind of got onto this joke where we feel like as fishermen, I know I've been this way. I'm sure some of you guys might also agree. And definitely some of the viewers out there watching this feel the same way. When we started fishing and using different lures, we felt like there was a, a way to work each type of lure that awards you a better chance of getting a strike. So fishing for redfish and trout and snook and a lot of the inshore game fish, we felt when we were trying to figure it out and starting out getting familiar with all these different lures, we, we were thinking there's got to be a way to work a jerk bait to get more strikes. There's got to be a way to work a paddle tail. But I, me and my craziness and my anal retentiveness took it a step further and said, what if there's like a cheat code or like a secret way, the right way just the right way to work that jerk bait or that paddle tail or that shrimp lure that's going to get me a bite more than everybody else. Like I would have thought that there was this secret to working a lure that gives you this competitive advantage. And I can say, I think in 15 years of doing this and tinkering with so many different soft plastics, if that still exists, we're going to kind of figure it out on the call. I haven't figured it out yet. I've caught some fish doing a lot of different variations and renditions of retrieval methods, different depths, dealing with current and wind and weight of different, you know, jig heads on soft plastics. Um, but overall, I think as, as a collective whole, we can say that for categories of lures, we found that there are types of retrievals that tend to be more productive than others. So in this call, we kind of want to break that down and address um, jerk baits, paddle tail, shrimp lures, topwater, anything we can kind of get our, our mitts on right now and say that we found that this has been more successful worked this way as a general whole, as a good baseline to build off of. Yeah. And then again, super important. And I like the fact that breaking down by lure type, because like a topwater will be totally different than a jerk, a jerk bait. And so let's, uh, I know a lot of our members use soft plastics as, as, as I do as well. So let's start with soft plastics. So let's go with a paddle tail. And who wants to kick it off? The best retrieve for a soft plastic paddle tail in case you're new to fishing. Like this is when we interview, we've interviewed a ton of guides over the years. And this is the one lure that is, that is almost always the one that people say the guides and, and really anybody else says they use the most. It is very versatile, um, but there are some retrieve nuances that you need to consider. So who's uh who wants to kick it off? I'll talk about the uh, the paddle tails. Uh, that is the lure that you're going to give to the person that has has never thrown a lure before. It's it's there's really no wrong way of working a paddle tail, but the most common is just a straight retrieve. And the speed of the retrieve is going to be determined on the depth of the fish and the the, the weight of the jig head and everything that's. Uh, uh, that goes along with that. But uh, if, if I'm searching fish, if I, yeah, there you go. If I'm searching fish, searching for fish, I'm going to be throwing that paddle tail. And depending on the mood of the fish is going to determine the rate at which I retrieve it. So if the fish are lethargic, if we just had a, you know, a cold front come through or, you know, the temperatures drop for whatever reason, I'm going to slow it way down. But if the fish are actively feeding and I'm seeing chasing bait and, and patrolling the shoreline, I'm going to cover some ground and pick up the pace. Uh, but you know that's not the only way to, to work a paddle tail. Uh, you can also you can also bounce them on the bottom just like a jerk bait, where you do the twitch twitch pause, or you can even uh, do a walk the dog type of uh, retrieve middle of the column. So say you're you're working a uh, school of bait fish and you got some trout that are feeding pretty heavily on them. Well, you can literally just twitch it like a like you'd be working a uh, a walk the dog lure. Uh, right through that school of bait fish and that'll get those trout attention and I've, I've had some really good days doing that yeah and, they, and they're just so versatile you can rig paddle tails on weighted hooks for the shallows you can put them on jig heads this is like a lighter jig head for mid column and you can do heavier jig heads and, and bounce the bottom but by far the most versatile lure out there and, and like what pat said there's a lot of retrieves but but the cool thing all of them work and uh, and really i'm a craving wrong but it seems to me like 
they all work, but some days one will work better than, than another. And it's not always a known when you get on the water. It's almost like you have to let the fish tell you sometimes. So, so I often yeah. find myself doing like multiple of those things Pat mentioned where like a twitch, twitch pause or just a straight retrieve or even retrieve pause. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes one works and, and then, and then like an hour later, it might switch to something else. So um, have you guys found like a certain condition where, where one retrieve is, is the one, or is it kind of a, a crapshoot, well, if you will? You, usually when, when I, when I'm throwing a paddle tail, I'm doing a straight, yeah, you know, I'm doing a straight retrieve with it. But what I found is like, say, especially on, you know, where we got these transitional days, like we have where it'll be a cool morning and then it warms up during the day. It could actually be that the retrieve that works first thing in the morning is not going to work an hour or two hours into the day where you have to pick it up. So if it's, you know, again, if it's cooler, I'm going to slow it down. But as that, that sun comes up, as that water temperature increases, then I'm going to increase my speed if that's what the fish want. I mean, you really, what, what, what you really have to be, uh, cognizant of is letting the fish tell you what they want. If you get locked onto a certain retrieve, like say that slow retrieve works for you first thing in the morning and you keep that same retrieve going, but you're not catching any fish. Well, the fish are telling you you're not doing something right. So you need to change up what you're doing. Uh, so that's that's a, a signal to uh, to you know make sure and do something different. But you know, don't wait, you know, an hour, two hours in the day and you're not catching anything to make that change. You want to do that uh, before that. Richard, yeah. any nuances for your your area there, Jacksonville, Georgia area? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it's it's funny that we're you know I've got all this going on in my brain. Like when I first started out as a new angler and started using paddle tails, you know I just always thought you've got to put so much action in life because you know that's what you always get told. Like you have to put the action into the lure. But with the paddle tail, I mean the great thing about it is, I mean you really can catch fish just at a super you know slow or moderate. I mean, it's got vibration, it's got action, and it looks natural when it's moving. Um, and recently, you know, I was always kind of against just the slow moving, you know, very slow, methodical, steady reel. But really the last year or two, that has become probably my favorite. I think the big reason is I'm just personally an impatient person when I'm fishing lures. But man, I can't tell you, especially some of my bigger fish, there's two things that I've really caught with paddle tails that seem to work. One is a very, very slow kind of roll, um, steady retrieve on the bottom. And the second one is when I do a little bit of a lift, very slow lift, and then on the drop, you go ahead and let it drop. And on that drop, I have caught so many big fish on paddle tails that way compared to doing the kind of jerk, jerk pause, you know, and stuff like that, which works great. And I love doing that. And we'll talk about, you know, like jerk shads and stuff later. That's one of my favorite lures, but with paddle tails, for some reason, that little bit of a fall, just that split second, that's when those predators, those big ones pounce on it. So that's something that I've noticed here. You know how with topwater lures, they call the technique and we'll go into that. They call it walk the dog, right? Well, with a paddle tail, I was kind of a late bloomer. I, I used jerk shads and like soft plastic stick baits, kind of like a, like a Merlure Lil John for many, many years in sight fishing, playing cat and mouse with redfish. And I, I kind of got into paddle tails with like on the bigger side, you know, I was throwing four and five inch paddle tails for bigger trout and on a weedless presentation. And I would find this slow, steady cadence and basically let that tail thump through the grass in one straight line and would have a lot of success over potholes. I went fishing one day with my friend Wade years back and he had a technique kind of like what you were talking about, Richard, where you were kind of like lift it up and let it fall. And I asked him, I said, what are you, what are you doing? He's like, well, you know how you call top water loose, call it walk the dog. Well, I call that drag the cat. And that's essentially what it is. Like you're slow, you're slow creeping. You just kind of sweep your rod. Right. And it just kind of like flutters up and then like falls down. So you're just dragging it. And you know, that, that is really productive. I've had times doing that. If I, if I want to have the vibration or like an injured, you know, profile to a, to a bait fish imitation, and I don't want to twitch it. I don't want something erratic. If the straight retrieve isn't cutting it, that, that break in the straight retrieve, but something that's not a twitch is kind of like an in-between. It's a drag. It's a pull through the water and then a pause. I, I kind of like that, but that's what I'm always going to call it. Trademarked drag, drag cat. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Even, and, and, and it's interesting. I didn't really think about it, but I use the twitch, twitch balls all the time for jerk baits. I rarely use it for, for paddle tails. It's more like what Richard said. If I'm going to do the up and down motion, 
it's more of a single a single up the the drag the cat <laughs> it's, it's more like that I, I don't do nearly as many as much twitch a double twitch and obviously i do it but i don't i don't get much success so i don't i don't really do it much often in wintertime a lot of times it's real and then just pause and then it's basically going going straight and then the pause and it goes down and then you start reeling it again and, and on that drop is when they'll hit it a lot of times they'll follow follow and just that one little pause just something different will get them to go ahead and strike it but uh yeah paddle tails I and mean, there's no the fact that they can be basically work with any retrieve especially a straight reel nothing fancy it's undoubtedly the most popular lure i think for really for all anglers especially newbies like if you want to start getting into lures and you don't know which one to go with go with the paddle tail right get, get some jig heads get some weighted hooks get a good paddle tail and you'll be ready for whatever depth you need because they just flat out work all right so i think we hammered that one how about soft plastic jerk sheds yeah. what do you guys do for that one so i i kind of want to take the rain on that because at over time, I've probably developed a, a, a deep appreciation you guys all have for how you bring this type of lure to life. The versatility of a soft plastic jerk shad is like unmatched. I would even say so over a lot of hard baits. I think that whether you twitch it up, down, left or right, this is the the versatility lure. It's it's You can work it so many different ways. As a general statement, as you read in magazines, articles, what have you, well, I'm sure we've even written it, that twitch, twitch, pause, retrieve is a general baseline. But what does that even really mean? Are you sweeping your rod to the left? Are you popping it up to the right? Is the twitch slow and methodical? Is it a fast, aggressive twitch? I mean, all of those little variations can be productive with this soft plastic. There isn't one, I would say, that's more successful than the other because Pat nailed it on the head. You're, you're not letting you're, you're working the trip, not letting the trip work you like the fish will tell you what they're, you know, what they're feeding best on. If you know, you're in an area that has fish and you want to find out kind of as your litmus test, how they're going to respond. This is probably going to be the way to be able to figure it out because you can work this slow. You can work it fast. You can drag it on the bottom. You can skip it on the surface. You have, you can work every part of the water column with a soft plastic jerk shad very effectively more so than so many other types of lures. So I would use this kind of as my indicator to see our fish getting spooked by their own shadow to where you almost need to drag it in front of them really, really slow with a very light hop in front of them. Do you need to stay in the middle part of the water column and let it kind of twitch and waft in the water column as it works past them? Um, do you need to have something that's almost to where you can work this lure so quickly that even though it's not a paddle tail, you can get left and right action out of that jerk shad if you're twitching it and retrieving it fast enough to where it looks like it's fleeing frantically. So just those three types of retrieves are going to be different responses from fish. Like they're, they're going to want it differently any given day. Um, and Richard, you mentioned something we were kind of talking about this beforehand. I want you to take ownership of that with when to figure out when you want to use those type of retrieves, when do you want to do it fast? When do you want to hover mid water, mid mid water, mid water column, whatever that was, or like you know work it closer to the bottom? Um, what's the biggest thing that helps you figure out when you're going to do that? Yeah, so just stating this is probably my favorite lure of all time and may always be. But when I love to use this lure is when I'm on a school of fish. The reason why is because I'm sure everyone's experienced this, like, you know, you're on a good school and you catch a few, like you're using a paddle tail or something else, but then they kind of, it's like, they just get smart and they're like, that lure is not good business, but with a jerk shad, like style lure, soft plastic, especially going back to what you said, Justin, you can work it so many different ways that you can continue to catch fish. You can get it where it's heavy on the bottom, just barely bumping, you know, on a soft bite. Like if it's more of a slack tide, you can kind of retrieve it where it's, you know, swimming a little bit in the column, you know, or you can be just a straight reaction bite with a bunch of competition with a school. I mean, you can work it so many different ways. Um, and then going into a little bit of what we talked about earlier, you know, some seasonality stuff, these are actually one of my favorite things to use in the winter. And the reason why is when fish are very, very slow, lethargic, 
Um, and sometimes they can just be kind of picky. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of people talk about this, but that style lure, you can retrieve it just like you would a paddle tail. And it's basically just a solid dart or mass moving in the water. And sometimes on those tough, tough days when there's just barely a little bit of a bite, that will do it. A paddle tail won't do it. Other lures won't. But I've had so much success doing that. Um, and I even did it a little bit with the hard bait, kind of the mirror minnow, the same style. I don't know what it is, but in the winter, sometimes just having a style of lure like that, that's a solid mass, not putting off any vibration or jerks or anything like that, will do it. Um, it, it's just so versatile and it's probably my favorite lure. So, so just a, just kind of like a straight retrieve, like let the profile do the work in front of the fish, not yep. a whole lot of action that when we talk about fishing for juvenile tarpon, Pat, we, we talk about that, you know, sometimes less is more in certain, I've never thought about doing that with a jerk shad, but in this call, I'm sure we're going to kind of learn little tricks that each other does, you know, and, and it might work well in our respective areas. That's really cool. Yeah, it's deadly. Yeah that, yeah, that was the exact bite I was on last week. Uh, it was a 2.0 with the uh, with the tail pulled off and uh, just slowly dragging it on the bottom. And that was the only thing they wanted. I mean, they didn't want to. They don't want the 2.0 with the paddle tail. They did want the Alabama leprechaun. They wanted that profile and just dra just drag it right along the bottom. And if you weren't off the bottom, you weren't getting a bite. But uh, if you were doing those things, it was almost a you know every cast. It was it was ridiculous. They were so dialed into that. And, you know, another thing about the um, that that jerk shad, you know, to me, I think that's one of the most versatile lures out there. Uh, there there's a way that people uh, probably really don't know how to work it. Uh, and I did this with bass fishing, you know, fishing like uh, lily pads, uh, but it also works excellent in potholes. So when it gets really, really cold, a lot of people like to use the, you know, they'll throw a hard bait, a, a slow uh, sinking or suspending like a, a uh, you know, mirror mirrodine. But how you can rig an Alabama leprechaun is put it on a weightless hook and you can actually change the size of that hook to like say a fine wire or even like a magnum and that will change the rate of the sink so you can work that Alabama leprechaun right to the edge of that pothole and it'll sink just as slow as like a mirrodine and that's irresistible with some of those trout I mean that's a that's a that's a great way to work that lure that a lot of people don't know about. Hmm. Yeah, it's one we haven't done. I do the potholes as well. I just go down to the smaller, the smaller twist lock. So this is the one sixteen ounce weight. This is my go-to for the winter time. Like the, when they get in the potholes, we get those low tides. It pushes all those fish off the mangroves, out of those holes in the flats. And this thing is deadly because you can rig it weedless and you can get right in their face. Right, these fish are going to be lethargic. And and uh, as I mentioned earlier, this you can work it slow and then you can give that quick little twitch. And even if it's a fish isn't hungry and they have a, like a little bait in front of them that's that kind of looks injured or looks scared, it's like their instinct to go and strike it. And so they can't even help it. They can be, this is the the my go-to lure in the winter up in the shallows right here. The the ones that really I, I need to try what you mentioned, Pat. I haven't tried the the weightless hook in a really long time. Um, since I found these these weighted ones, that's pretty much all I've gone with. But that makes total sense where you can have it go even slower, especially after like a really strong cold front. You can uh, you can take it slower and it has a little bit less splash when it lands. So if the fish are spooky, I think that's a that's definitely something I'm going to add to my arsenal. Yeah, like well, like for big trout, right? Like that's the first thing I thought of is I've always thought of it, but I've never actually tried it where you find an area where there's 24, 25 inch or bigger trout and they're so shallow that sometimes the splash of a weighted hook might be too much, but you want to stay in the strike zone. So I do think that, yeah, that that's something that we should definitely revisit here, like in the wintertime in particular. I'm with Luke. This was my go-to for sight fishing reds when I started. Um, in grass, around Swiss cheese bottom or potholes, this was the thing that I could dissect and very lightly pop or drag or pull through grass in front of fish and could almost guarantee a strike. Like th this was the one for many, many years. And then I started doing more around docks. Like usually if we're talking about seasonality uh, in warmer weather months, you know, April, May, and later on, or, or anytime in fall, if I wanted a bigger profile and I want to kind of hover mid water column, this was my go-to around docks. Um, I need to revisit it, especially with you, Luke, getting a bunch of triple tail. This was like, you know, this works differently than a shrimp lure, which is kind of what I want to segue into next. Like our, our power prawn, this is quickly becoming my current favorite lure of like maybe of all time. I don't know, but 
this has become super versatile but in fishing for triple tail recently you were smoking fish on this like in a way where we were throwing the prawn for a little while trying to get that same response trying to imitate a, a crustacean that we know that's what they're looking for for the most part and you were plucking them out with this i mean you went three for three in a couple of weeks like it was just it's crazy i don't know why i don't know if it's because of how it sinks or there's a little bit of a spin or a little twitch to the left and the right this was the ticket man so yes. this is bringing back my confidence in this lure yeah and, and this uh, this is what i use when i was tournament fishing like almost all the winning fish was on was on the this exact setup and, and I, back then i was using the gulp jerk shads but it was the same hook and now and now we have leprechauns now this is my go-to but but i think the reason why it's, it's so good is when it's rigged properly rigging is incredibly important on this this is so this is more advanced than the paddle tail because the rigging has to be right there's less room for error on these soft plastic jerk shads so just wanted to emphasize that if, if there's any kink at all in this lure when the hook when you put the hook on it it's going to helicopter and that's the best way to not catch anything that's that's usually when when people have trouble with with these jerk shads is because they didn't rig it properly and so make 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 a point to look at the lure once it's done and make sure that everything looks streamlined if you see any curves at all take the hook off and redo it but when it is rigged properly it is amazing and I, as justin said this triple tail were just sitting right on the buoy they weren't they weren't reacting to anything and so it, it was just doing that slow sink and then right in front of their face twitch it and that just that little twitch that just triggered something in their brain and their tiny little brain even that one it was over 20 inches it hit like it hit like six feet in front of us it was right there oh, yeah. that, was it was just that little twitch and, it, and, it, and the, the, you can see the triple tail react a little bit and then just went and just hammered it um, so like this is the best lure when rigged properly for triggering a fish that isn't hungry to still go ahead and eat. Exactly. Um, so this is like a, this is I would say this is a must have for any any angler and just take some practice like as we mentioned before and I even like Dave Audie one of our members he catches a lot of really good trout trolling behind his kayak, which is something that I've never I've never really done trolling the, the just the, again no paddle tail, and he he crushes them up there in the up in the panhandle so. Redfish and trout. I like it. Yeah, next time you're out there, uh, uh, that Alabama leprechaun, just do a slow reel and watch it. It actually, it doesn't go straight in the water. It actually, it kind of works back and forth just like a bait fish would. It's, yeah, when, uh, I can definitely see how that would work. Yeah, I've caught a lot of fish too, like when I'm reeling real fast for the next cast, like a, it's like a strike will happen over here. And so I'm like trying to get the lure in. And, and when it's when it's rigged right on that weighted hook, the tail's doing like this right here in the water. And I've caught a good amount of fish doing that. I've never tried like a slow troll. I guess it's probably doing like a little weave. But uh, but either way, it, it, it absolutely, absolutely works. And just like the other one, or there's just so many, so many different things. And, and usually the best answer is to try like every cast, just switch it up. And then let the fish tell you what uh, what they're what they're responding to. So exactly. shrimp lure next, Justin. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So shrimp lure, like th this, our our power prawn that we've that we've kind of designed and figured out exactly how long they need to be, like the slit in the belly here, the thickness of the tail on the backside. Everything about either the junior or the original has quickly caught, I think, just about every inshore species. I've yet to catch a flounder, but that's because I need to go up and fish with you more, Richard, and, and go get on some flounder. But, I mean, big snook, big red. My biggest redfish on artificial to date was probably 42, 43 inches on the prawn. It's in January of this year. I even got like a 50-pound tarpon on this lure on, on a half-ounce jig head. Everything eats this. And it's not just because you know, all fish eat shrimp. I mean, that's a given. That is the number one bait source for every single game fish that we're targeting. But it's, it just looks so darn real in the water. Not necessarily looking at it out of the water, but when you slowly reel this through the water, either on a jig head or on a custom weedless hook, it looks like a shrimp swimming through the water. And I think a lot of people out there still wonder and think, well, shrimp you know don't they don't they go backwards in the water well when a shrimp is natural and it's swimming if you've ever spent time at night around a bridge or, or a dock light and you see shrimp swim by they do just that they swim straight they only really flee backwards when they're being pursued by something and they're trying to retreat but even at the same time if the shrimp is unaware that anything is targeting it and it's moving up and down through the water column. It'll, it'll kind of go down and then up and it'll rise down and go left and right and sway. And it, tr and it goes in a straight line head first. 
This on a jig head is probably my favorite lure to use uh, when fishing anything in deeper water. If I'm fishing anything in excess of four or five feet, power prone on a jig head is always going to be tied on in one of my three setups, anything that I do. Um, now, even when I'm going after monster fish, when I'm going after like potentially 80 pound plus tarpon here in the wintertime, this is what I'm going to have tied on on heavier jig heads. It's crazy good. Um, Overall, Luke, when you were testing this, because this is this is a prototype in the making, like you had tested a bunch of different shrimp, shrimp lures. We've used gulp shrimp. We've used DOA. We've used Savage Gear and Voodoo and so many others. And this one across the board in terms of its versatility and how many different ways you can rig it, working it shallow or deep, you, you found a lot of different ways to work it. What would you say is the number one way that you found to work the power prawn in your testing that allows you the most amount of strikes. So what I found is, is more the, I would say the, the walk the cat that, uh, or drag the cat. <laughs> drag the cat. And, and so it's a single retrieve, but it's not as quite as jerky as like a, a jerk bait. Like when I'm, when I'm doing the, the jerk bait in the grass, it's more of like a, I do the, the double twitch where twitch to get out of the grass, another twitch to dart up and then, and then flutter down uh, with, with the shrimp. It's more of a, a one, like a, a just kind of pull it up, raise the rod tip up, and then keep the rod tip up so the shrimp doesn't go straight down. It'll it'll go down like this. It'll go forward down. That's when the strike happens. And it, it is crazy. I mean, it was – when I started testing this lure, I, I've never really been a big shrimp fan, and I just kept getting bigger and bigger fish. Like my average fish size skyrocketed when I was really focused on the shrimp fishing, especially around docks. I would have these heavier jig heads and I would do a one up and then it would flutter forward, or I guess, drop forward swim. And those snook, they really, they snook in particular, I obviously caught a lot of redfish and trout doing it too, but those snook just absolutely dial this in. And where I learned it from was one of our internet club uh, members, Marcos down in the Everglades. He's from Brazil, which is where these are made. He's the one that introduced us to these, uh, these shrimp lures and he's fishing these tournaments down there in the Everglades and winning a lot of them and against live bait anglers too. And he doesn't use anything other than this one shrimp. And he has just different size jig heads based on the depth. I literally saw his tackle box. There's nothing other than a bunch of jig heads and then a bunch of these shrimp lures. And he, he just absolutely wrecks those big snook. I, when we went fishing one of them, is I've never seen that many overslot snook hooked in one day on lures. Looks like Justin's starting to get that way too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but eight, eight, Matt say eight, eight, eight ways from Sunday or something. Yeah, so many different ways. And, yeah. and on the on the retrieve backwards and you know for like when the when shrimp that you know they're scared they do do go backwards. But even if you do a pretty fast a fast twitch, right? Like the fish aren't like analyzing. Oh, did they did that twitch forward or backwards? Right? They just see a quick a quick motion, which is what shrimp do. And then after that quick motion, they see it slowly swim, and that's that's their time to strike. And it is shocking how effective this is. And, and just like before, it needs to be rigged properly, obviously needs to have the right um, rigging uh, weight or, or weighted hook based on the depth you're fishing. But, uh, but I'm, I'm with Justin, like this is becoming my favorite, one of my favorite lures. Yeah, we're, we're kind of learning a trend that that pause and that descend is, is the key trigger in a lot of these plastics, whether it's paddle tail, jerk shad, or, or it, most notably the shrimp it's that pause and descend that we tend to get the majority of our bites. So in figuring out how to work each of these lures, being mindful of knowing that while the strike can happen at any point of that cadence, it seems like the majority of the strikes happen on that descend and on right after, right at the start of that pause, whether it's a lift or it's a hop or what have you, when there's that break in, in the routine of the movement, that's when these fish seem to like jump on it. And, and I'm not sure why, I don't know if it's like a trigger that says, it's getting away or it's seeking refuge in structure or something that forces them to say, I got to eat it then, as opposed to when it's on the move or on the pop, it always tends to be on the pause. I don't know why. Something interesting. And Richard, anything unique in the, in the dirtier water with shrimp lures that you found works? Yeah, absolutely. So starting out with shrimp lures, when I first started to get into them, my absolute favorite way uh, or area to fish them was under dock lights at night that's kind of how I got into it and you could you could see it better and then I don't know if it's the the fly fisherman in me with doing a dead drift on a mountain stream for trout but man my absolute favorite way to fish these shrimp lures is on a very very you know either lightweighted hook or super light jig head 
And in the areas that I'm at, we've got a lot of current. So, man, you can throw that thing kind of 45 degrees up for it from you and just let it sweep in the current through that hole. And we have a lot of trout here that fit, you know, kind of feed middle of the water column in these deep holes. And sometimes it's kind of tough to find where they are. And you can kind of spook them a little bit if you have too heavy of a jig head and stuff like that. But if you put that shrimp lure in there, it, I mean, it's almost every single cast and they nail it. Um, and it's one of my favorite ways to fish. It's kind of technical and it's, you know, the advanced portion of it would really go down to what you said, Luke, getting the right weight. That is crucial um, with this lure. You know, you need to have several jig heads, even weighted hooks, and they all fall a little bit different too. Um, but man, putting that, that thing in current and letting it just do a dead drift and just having enough tension to see if uh, the fish hits it. I mean, you'll, you will absolutely slam fish doing that. Yeah, it's solid lure. And uh, again, shrimp, shrimp is one thing I didn't use too much. And now it is, it has a whole, whole section of the tackle bag. Um, all right. So let's see, I know, uh, Pat, uh, one of the first podcasts we did with you, right? Not one of the first podcasts we did with you was on top water. So Pat, in case you, anybody missed it. So Pat went an entire year, literally an entire year only using top water plugs. And so I think top water is just so much fun. We, we have to do, uh, do a segment on that. So Pat, of, of, as far as what you found during that entire year of topwater plugs, what was the one or two or three retrieves that, that you found got the most action? You know, out of all of the lures that I've ever used, I think the retrieve on a topwater is probably more important uh, than any others. And it's really what triggers the strike. So if you're talking about, say, um, let's talk about the, the Moonwalker, which is a standard a walker type lure where you just work it back and forth. I don't have one on me. There you go. I don't have one on me, but uh, but that how you work that lure is is you just twitch the rod tip, usually at a lower angle, at a steady cadence, reel in the slack, you know, and and twitch it as you go. So you're you're twitching and reeling at the same time, and it causes that lure to, to walk back and forth. Now it sounds simple enough, but there's a lot of different ways even in that, that you can work it. So it's the aggressiveness, it's the speed, it's uh, if you put pauses in there, all those trigger different strikes. And, and what I realized is, again, with, with any, with any other lures that we were talking about, you want to match the the lure retrieve with the the mood of the fish. So if the if the fish are, are feeding actively, then you're gonna work it faster. But if they're not, the weather's a little bit cooler, especially again uh, when we come up here in the springtime. That's when I'll start throwing uh, topwaters again. I'm really not throwing them right now, but say come uh, late February or early March, I'll start start throwing them again. But it's really a, a very, very slow walk the dog. Like I'll start out with a lure that's not, uh, that's not, you know, loud at all. Something like a, like a mirror minnow or, or the, sorry, a mirror mullet is what they call that one. It's a uh, mirror lure. The, the rattle on it's not very loud at all. And when the fish are, when the water's cold, uh, they really don't react well to a, a loud lure. So I like to use a quieter lure and I'm going to work it super slow. There's been times I've been out there where in the morning time, you'll, you know, that year that I did the top water, I had to figure out, you know, how to get it light. So in the morning time, in a cold morning, it was literally twitch. I would let it sit five seconds, twitch, let it sit five seconds or twitch it once or twice, let it sit five or six seconds. And that just as we were just talking about, it was the pause, they would hit it on the pause. And uh, of course you're not covering a lot of ground to uh, work in that way, but that's what it did. Now on that same day, as the water temperature warmed and the day warmed up, uh, you could actually start working it faster. So as they started getting in that, uh, that feeding mode, then you could start covering some ground and working it faster, but it was definitely match the retrieve to the mood of the fish and basically the temperature of the water. Now, by the time uh, summertime rolls around in, that's a steady retreat. And, uh, you know, that's when the moonwalker really kicked in. It, it really works great in that late spring, uh, summer, fall time. And, you know, again, in the nuances of walking the dog with that one is uh, if it's a calm day, if there's just a barely uh, a ripple in the water you're not really pulling that you know you're not really pulling it really hard you're just barely twitching it but if there's a chop on the water and there's a lot of 
what we, you know, kind of noise, you know, the waves are splashing, they're making a lot of noise, or even if there's a lot of bait fish, that's another scenario. When you're working that lure, you're really ripping it hard. And that way, what you're doing, you're trying to throw as much water and make as much commotion as you can to draw attention to that lure instead of all the other bait fish in the area. So even in the same exact scenario where we're talking about walk the dog, there's a bunch of different ways. So uh, it, the way I'll, I'll work lure is, is I'll start by matching the outside conditions, the water conditions, like say if it's calm, I'm gonna work it slower and I'm gonna work it uh, you know, at, a, at an easier pace. And then as the, uh, as the wind picks up or there's more bait fish, then I'll, uh, then I'll work it a little bit harder. But, uh, but yeah, there, you really just have to keep changing up throughout the day and just let the fish tell you what they want. That attention to detail is everything. Like I'm playing back a scenario where I was on the flats in Indian river on a friend's boat, but we're eight plus years ago. And you know, the Rapala skitter walk was a staple for many, many years. And all I ever saw in TV shows and friends working it is a steady fast paced retrieve, twitch, 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 walk the dog left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, all the way back to the boat. No variation, same way all the time. Doesn't matter whether it was calm or it was windy. That was just as if that was the only way to work it. That's how I saw so many people do it. And mm -hmm. I thought that that's how you had to do it. And I mean, just that, that attention to detail, Pat, is, is kind of what we're talking about. It's, it's being fluid and being variable in your different retrieves to increase your opportunities at, at success on varying days. And, and that changes so frequently. So hearing you say that, I'm just thinking of all the times where like, I'm sure in my head, I'm like, well, I want to slow down my retrieve, but I kind of felt that pressure of the guys like, no, this is the way you work this lure to get bites. We know. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's not the same from one day to the next, even if conditions are identical. So the fact that you're picking up and saying, I have a baseline of if it's calmer, generally slower cadence. And when it's a little bit choppier, you tend to speed up your cadence probably to get noticed, right? Because you're combating right. chop and noise and all kinds of things. It's those variables that you're, you're keyed in on. And that's just, that's just what gets me excited. It's kind of the baseline for this whole podcast is knowing that there's like, there's no like Bible of how to do it, but there's a guideline, there's a general template and it, and it changes all the time. Yeah. And there's even uh, like, I've got you know, two different moonwalkers that I, that I use for calmer conditions and rougher conditions. The one that I use for rougher condition, I put a larger hook on the back. So it sits in the, uh, in the water a little bit angled down. So when you work it uh, harder, it doesn't come out of the water. It'll just throw water. Whereas if you try to try a moonwalk with the same size hooks that sits more parallel, you'll really kind of just pull it out of the water. So it does make a difference, even same exact lure working it the same way just doing a slight modification to it can make a difference. And, and even at that, but yeah, you're right there. Just to prove your point, there's, there's no one way to work a lure that's going to work in all situations. Sweet. Let's uh, let's finish it with the, so a subsurface hard bait and, and Richard, I know you just did a good review on the mirror lure. Is it the, the mirror minnow, if I remember right? Yeah. So mirror minnow. Yeah. What type of retrieves do you guys use for those, those subsurface plugs? Yeah, so there's several. Um, you know, you've got your most common typically, which is going to be kind of a twitch, twitch pause or like a twitch pause. Um, and it really can vary going back again, like what Pat was saying on kind of conditions and water temperature and things like that. But one of the things that I've found, you know, that actually is a ton of success is actually just doing a steady retrieve um, on some of these lures. And you will be surprised at how many fish will go after just a steady retrieve and some of them do swim pretty well um, especially like your mirror lures um, but like in the winter the mirror minnow I actually just did it a few days ago um, I was doing a steady retrieve um, on a flat the sun was out the water was still pretty cold they were not hitting any type of you know quick uh, jerk reaction or anything like that so I just started doing a very slow steady retrieve and what do you know that was the formula for the day you know and that lure doesn't even have you know, hardly any action, you know, when you swim it, but sometimes that's all it takes. So those are probably the most common ones that I use. And um, a lot of it will depend on what water depth I want those lures to get at as well. And kind of where you're fishing, if you're fishing a deeper hole, or if you're on like a mud flat, sometimes that'll change it too, just to make sure you're in the right part of the, the zone. Because with those lures, you know, I really think they're made to be fished in a certain type of zone. 
Um, so you want to know whichever one you're using, you're kind of catering to that as well. Um, so that's that's typically the things that I think of. But what, what do you guys do? I mean, for me, working a Miradine, I think, is the one that I'll probably work the most. And I, I grabbed a couple others right here suspending Twitch base. Like I've got you know, Zuri makes one, you know, for those of you out there that remember the name for many, many years, the Sabil Stick Shad was probably like one of the most popular $15, $20 suspending Twitch baits, at least for the inshore saltwater market here in Florida. Uh, guys over in Texas, Corky's, you live and die by Corky's and Paul Brown, you know, Paul Brown lures, they're exceptional, and but they're definitely applicational as, as Richard pointed out. So in terms of the technicality scope, I would say suspending hard baits are probably the most technical because it gets down to even what type of line you use, what type of rod you use to impart different actions. And, and that rings true for soft plastics as well, but I don't know as much so because the glide aspect of a suspending hard bait covers a lot more of an area a lot of times, you know, depending on, on the shape of the suspending hard bait. So for me, for Miradines, I started, you know, the arc of which I started working, working it really quickly, just really aggressive twitches to get the flash of the lure because the 17 MR 18 color, which is that holographic side with the dark green top. That was, I mean, that's like probably the number one selling mirror Dean that the mirror lure makes. It's one of the main ones we carry on our shop page. This one's a pilchard color, but you know, when I started, it was really aggressive twitches and it was on the edge of dock lines for snook. I wanted an, an instinct response. I wanted a very aggressive response from fish that would pull them away from the structure, slash at something and get hooked up. So for the most part, it was really aggressive, erratic twitches. And I think over time, um, I, I started to switch that up when I was fishing over potholes for trout and those really erratic twitches weren't getting hit. So I would slow down, I would glide it. Sometimes I would just pause and I'd do that straight retrieve and I would get bit. And it was those different variations I found that I started to incorporate into my retrieval for any suspending hard bait that, that awarded me more, more success. It wasn't that aggressive twitch that I think a lot of anglers want to start with. And I think that that has its place, right? But it's not going to work all the time. Um, that, the straight retrieve, Richard, is underestimated. People overlook that. And I think they, they, they do a lot to allure to try to get it noticed or bring more life into a lure, but the less is more concept is definitely applicable here. And with the soft plastic jerk shot, I never thought about that. Now I'm gonna have to try it. Um, but for this, there's times that just, uh, just a simple light twitch and then just keep it on its regular track and not make another movement for maybe four or five seconds can be very, very productive, especially in probably calm conditions. Um, so for me, like this gets to be really technical. Like if I wanted to, you know, be a purist, if you will, or we talk about simplicity and specialist, right? Well, I don't have enough hair to like whip it back and do the Fabio thing, but simplicity and specialist approach um, to be a specialist at hard baits. I mean, Pat, that, that might be the next venture is one year, whether you do it or I step up to the plate and I do it. One year of nothing but suspending hard baits would be would be an interesting uh, case study because you're probably dropping down to softer tipped rods. You're probably even going to consider going with straight mono or fluoro, so you have a stretch aspect to maintain connection with fish. I mean, it gets it gets really really technical, and I kind of love that. But in terms of a general overall you know movement for a suspending hard bait, the twitch twitch pause retrieve is true. But I think the biggest things to keep in mind are whether you're twitching your rod up, you're twitching it to the side, you're twitching it down, because that is going to dictate where this lure is placed in the water column on the, on the way that it twitches. And this is intended to be a mid-water column lure for the most part. This is when you're working three to four feet at minimum, sometimes deeper, and you want it to stay in that middle part of the water column and, and create action within that zone. Yeah. So, uh, Oh, go, for, go for Richard. I was saying, yeah, that's, that's so true, Justin. I mean, and I think of all the baits that we've mentioned today, this one is going to be the most where you really have to listen to the fish on what they're telling you that day. Um, you know, I, I did that video on the mirror minnow. I mean, I probably caught, you know, 30, 40 fish that day. And there was one retrieve that consistently they hit. Now, there were some others where they kind of would tap it a little bit, but they didn't eat it. 
And for that day, it was a twitch twitch and continuing to move the bait. They did not want anything to do with a dead standing, you know, kind of suspending bait. They wanted it to keep moving, but they needed a little bit of flash kind of encouragement is what I was thinking in my, in my mind. But as soon as as soon as that happened, they would nail it and they would nail it as soon as the, the twitches were over. Um, and it was just going that straight retrieve, give it two or three seconds, another twitch, twitch. And these weren't real big ones. They were just enough to kind of get that body to move to the side and get a flash, you know, just something that's a little bit erratic, but enough where they could key in on it. And it was killer. And that was the only thing that they would hit for several hours, you know, for, for out of all the retrieves I tried and I tried a bunch, you know, so you really got to listen to the fish, uh, what they're telling you on these lures. Sweet. Pat, anything to add to that on the subsurface? No, I think, uh, I think Richard kind of nailed it. It's, it. Again, it's just like all the others. You just got to let the fish, uh, you know, tell you what they want that day. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, with Justin and, uh, and Richard on that. That straight retrieve is just, it's, it's underestimated. You, you catch so many more fish when you just try to keep things uh, simple and a lot of times the the really really hard jerks and the aggressiveness it's a reaction it's a reactionary strike right? but sometimes you don't need a reactionary strike you just need to to cover ground and get it get that lure in front of as many fish as possible very true and so we have to wrap this thing up so um yeah hopefully you enjoyed it um just know that the number one thing by far that by far trumps the best retrieve on lures although the retrieve is very important is finding the fish that's always the number one thing because if you have the best retrieve possible in a spot with no fish, you're not going to catch anything. And so that's, that's really why what our, our club is about. So if you're not yet part of the club, just know that, that we really focus on finding the fish on helping you find redfish, sea trout, snook, flounder throughout the entire season. And then, and then the, you know, like triple tail tarpon, the seasonality fish too, but it's all about inshore fishing on just maximizing your time in the water. Number one, finding the fish every trip. Number two, discounts in your tackle. All these lures we just talked about, at least almost all of them, I think, um, yeah, I guess 100% of the ones we mentioned, they're all on our online store, fishstrong.com, and all insider members get huge discounts on them, at least 20% or more um, for, for most of the items on there. And so you can save a ton of money. And then number three is you can meet a ton of friends. We have a private community platform. It's kind of like a Facebook on steroids, where it's like a Facebook feed that's fun, but it's all regional. You can sort by region, you can sort by species. You can ask questions to the members who are posting. It's amazing. So highly recommend giving it a shot. We have a full 365 day guarantee that you're going to love it. If you don't, you can get all your money back. Uh, we know that won't be the case though, because you can, again, find the fish, save money and meet new friends. So if you want to give that a shot, we'll put a link down below, or you can just go to saltstrong.com, sign up there. As soon as you sign up, you'll get a welcome email. All you have to do is be able to click that link in the welcome email and you're logged in. It's super simple. You don't need a, a technical degree to, to join. Um, highly recommend giving it a shot. And any questions at all about these lures or the retrieves, just leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, also about future future topics you want us to cover. Uh, we get a lot of the, the best ideas from, from you. So, uh, so please do not hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Comment feed down below for that. Otherwise, we will see y'all next week.